All right, here's the first lesson of Unit 1.2, the Reconstruction, also known as the sec First Civil Rights Movement. You're going to get an inventory sheet. That's your snap chart for this lesson. Kind of looks like this. After the video cast and going through the various plans of what's going on here, you're going to basically make this checklist and uh, go through it and uh, identify uh, what characteristics each plan has. There's three of them. There's one for Lincoln, one for the radical Republicans who control Congress. Remember, there's no Southerners in Congress. And then Andrew Johnson's restoration, which is going to kick in after Lincoln is assassinated. Uh, you should be able to identify a summary purpose and goal between each of them and answer the question as to what Andrew Johnson's Southern roots and his influ uh, influences, how that influences his treatment of African Americans. The Reconstruction debate begins with some very simple questions. We've got the uh, Union saved. The rebellion is put down. Now the challenge is reuniting things, uh, reunite, reunite, reunited the country, rebuilding the country. How do we do that? How do re uh, southern states get readmitted? Uh, how is it that they are rebuilt economically, politically, socially, uh, society? Should we re remake them? Uh, this question, these, this fight is going to go on for a good next 20 years, and uh, it is going to be a very violent time. It's also known somewhat as America's Second Civil War. Uh, it's difficult to say the least. So two competing plans. The first plan is Lincoln's plan. Uh, his mindset is, as you look at the quote there from his second inaugural address, uh, the malice toward none, charity for all, no punishment. He doesn't want any more punishment or pain. Serves no purpose. It is only going to delay healing the torn nation. Uh, however, the radical Republicans, these are really our first egalitarian civil rights activists, want punishment. They want transformation of the South. They want to be something more like the North. And they don't want to be agrarian based anymore. And that whole slave thing, of course, is going to go away. Lincoln's plan is introduced in the middle of the war, December 1863. Uh, about a year after, almost a full year after the Emancipation Proclamation. And he basically says that in my plan, 10% of the voters, if you can get them in every southern state to swear an oath of allegiance, then they can go ahead and get their best and brightest together to form a new state constitution. It, of course, is going to accept the 13th Amendment. Congress will then approve it. Plus, if anyone who is a southern leader wants amnesty, they've got to come to him. Uh, every southerner is going to get amnesty basically except those Confederate leaders that led the rebellion and secession. As the war is going on, he's proposed this and he's actually establishing Lincoln governments, what came to be known as Lincoln governments in three states, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, and these are, if you look at the map, connected to very major waterways where Union armies are flowing into them and controlling them with the armies. Uh, and they establish loyal local state assemblies there. And it's really a minority rule of Republican-minded people. Uh, Union-minded people uh, dependent on the military to exist, but the radical Republicans, like Thaddeus Stevens here, key person to know, uh, resists this idea and plan of established things, reunited things, reunited the country as the war is going on. This is too easy. We've got to come up with a plan that's harsh and significantly punishing on and reforming of the South. Right from his mouth, the South, Southern institutions must be broken up and relayed or all of our blood and treasure has been spent in vain, completely lost for nothing. And actually, he and other radical Republicans threatened to deny seats in Congress to those representatives from any states that were going to be readmitted under Lincoln's plan. That whole process still holds today when there is an election coming up every two years and new congressmen are chosen. Uh, the congressmen that are there, the veterans, basically vote them in to say, you are legitimate and you can be part of us. Well, the radical Republicans were going to say, we're not going to allow that. The Confederates argued that, or uh, the radical Republicans uh, argued that the Confederates committed suicide when they seceded. Now they must rejoin and submit to our will to rejoin and our rules to rejoin, to prove that they are worthy of being part of the Union. So the radical Republicans come up with their own plan, and that plan is the Wade Davis bill. Uh, when a majority of a state's white male swore an oath, an ironclad oath, saying, I never, ever was disloyal to the Union, then, and they rationalized, there's got to be more, more than 10% of the population in the South and those Southern states that rebelled. That doesn't make sense. That's too, too easy. Then the states, after a majority have this ironclad oath, can set up a constitutional convention. Only Southerners who swore that they didn't fight in the rebellion can participate in those conventions. And then the new constitution, like Lincoln's plan, would have to adopt and uh, approve of the 13th Amendment banning slavery, and former Confederates would be banned from public office. This is a big deal. A large 
portion of the powers that be, the elite in the South, cannot be a part of public office. This is big pow pow is politically for Southern leaders. And so they want new people in the South, right? Those that were not part of the rebellion. And then freemen would have political equality. This is a big deal. Political equality, the same as whites, anybody else in the North. 1865, at the end of that year, December 1865, 13th Amendment is passed, ratified December 6th. Excuse me, December 1865. Passed Congress January 31st, scratch that there, January 31st, 1865, and ratified at the end of the year, December 6th, 1865. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime. If you were convicted of a crime, you could be put into servitude. Kind of an interesting thing for a future lesson. Slavery is gone, for the most part, unless you're arrested for a crime. That is key. Lincoln doesn't like it. It's too harsh. The Wade Davis bill is too difficult, too harsh, too punishing. He pocket vetoes it. He lets it sit. And after 10 days, according to the Constitution, it dies. He wants, again, state governments to be formed quickly in order to restore the South into the Union as quick as possible. So there is a need for a compromise somewhere here, but there's not a lot of room for compromise. There's a little bit of similarity there, but not a lot. March 1865, the Freedmen's Bureau was passed. This might be an example of that compromise between Lincoln and the radical Republicans. This is significant. This is one of the most important things you need to know from the Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau. Its purpose is to help illiterate, impoverished freedmen adjust to freedom. It provides food, clothing, medical assistance, ability to help them find land, find work, and would actually set up, as you see in the image here, representatives, most often former Union soldiers, to represent them in labor business disputes with Southern whites in the South. This even also helped poor whites in all these aspects. So it is a way of, and really the first example ever, of a federal agency being established to help a specific group of people ever in our history early day welfare, you might say, in a way. And we'll look at some criticisms of this later on. The biggest success, and you've got to put this down as a big star and highlight this, is the Freedmen's Bureau. The biggest success of the Freedmen's Bureau, rather, is the fact that it set up schools, establishing education for African Americans that, by the slave codes for generations, were not allowed to be, by law, banned to be educated, taught to read and write, all that kind of thing. This also then later on extends into our college system in a vast growth in num the number of colleges, in African-American black colleges in the South after that point in time. And you notice if you look at this picture, there's all kinds of different sizes of kids here. These are one-room schoolhouses. In some of these pictures, you could also see adults in these schools. Everybody, the five-year-old was no more literate or illiterate than the 30, 40, 50-year-old. Everybody was banned from becoming literate. Well, that's going to change now. This is the longest lasting, most positive impact of the Freedmen's Bureau. Good intentions in every, everywhere else, but the Freedmen's Bureau is the most successful piece, or the education uh, focus is the most successful piece of the Freedmen's Bureau. April 14th, 1865, Lincoln is assassinated. Ford's Theater, many of us probably know this, the Brad Pitt of the time, John Wilkes Booth, enters his private box, shoots him in the back of the head, and Lincoln dies hours later. Booth is caught, shot, and killed. The other conspirators are put in trial. Several of them hung. We'll maybe look at that a little bit later. Vice President Andrew Johnson becomes president. Andrew Johnson is significant in all this. He's very significant in that he is from the state of Tennessee. And he was chosen in the 1864 election to be Lincoln's running mate because he was close to those border states where there was union-minded people. And Johnson is a union-minded senator. In fact, he's the only senator from a southern seceding state not to secede from the union. He stayed loyal. And so this helped Lincoln in that 1864 election get those votes in the border states. But he grew up in poverty. He had strong states' rights views, but he also was a union guy, champion of the common man. He hated the upper class of southern society, the aristocracy. He kind of felt that southerners were tricked into secession. Hero in the north, traitor in the south, he becomes military governor of Tennessee in 1862, but he's famous for also saying white men alone should rule and manage the South. So as he becomes president, how do you think that manages with or fits with the radical Republican ideal of political equality? Probably doesn't. In fact, it's going to be a major, major conflicting point. There is going to be a president who wants a 
means of constructing the South and a Congress that has a different means of reconstructing the South. This is a big problem. And there is Tennessee right there by these border states. So we have a Southerner as president who is in controlling the White House and the executive branch and radical Republican Northerners controlling the Congress. And so Johnson's plan is called the restoration. If you think about an old car, you restore it. It's basically the same as it came out of the factory in the year that it was built. Look at the quote. Yep, not a lot of changes other than there's no slavery. Congress was not in session when he took power and took office and when he institutes his restoration plan. And when a person swears loyal to the union, then they can get amnesty and get a general pardon of forgiveness. And high-ranking Confederate officers could get this pardon as well, but they had to go directly to the president and he make them grovel at his feet. He wanted to humiliate those people. Uh, but he's allowing basically widespread mass amnesty, forgiveness of any offenses. And then you could come back into the system. But he opposes, you can see the quote here, equal rights and freedom for African Americans. Equal political rights, you should say. I have to fix that, man. For freed men, not freedom, but for freed men, he opposes that. So once that happens, state constitutional conventions could be established and only loyal, pardoned whites can vote for delegates. That means former Confederates could be part of those constitutional conventions and lead in the same positions they led in before the secession event and before the war to radical Republicans. That's no, no. That's rewarding them for bad behavior, letting them back into the system. We need new people with new thinking that's more like ours. The states must denounce secession. The states must ratify the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. By the end of 1865, every Confederate state, with the exception, I think, of Texas, was ready to come back into the Union, have representatives in Congress, and the Radical Republicans are just saying, we'll have none of it. Here are the Radical Republicans on the Congress side, no surrender, and here it is, Andrew Johnson, President, saying, do you want 36 states again, or do you want to keep it at 25? 25 Union only, or do you want all 36? We need to have all 36 on my train. So the radical Republicans are not happy like this. And basically, they're about this. And they're basically powerless until Congress comes back into session. And when they do, they're going to have their own plans. And Johnson's going to resist those plans. He's going to veto them. He's going to anger the radical Republicans uh, enough that there are going to be more radical Republicans voted into office in Congress. And they're going to start overriding his vetoes. That's for another time. So with your left side, uh, Inventory sheet, go ahead and place some check marks as to where the characteristics fit for each of the different plans. So you can see similarities and differences. That'll help you make, make up and complete your reflection and you're good to go for lesson one. See you next time. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>